Welcome to ClueCon Weekly. Join us every Wednesday to learn about the latest cutting edge developments in the real time communications industry. ClueCon Weekly is brought to you by FreeSwitch Solutions. Get support and professional services directly from the creators of the FreeSwitch open source project, solving your issues in the most efficient, stable, and scalable way possible. Get the FreeSwitch advantage. Visit freeswitch.com. Also brought to you by ClueCon, the premier technology conference for developers by developers. Join us every summer in Chicago. ClueCon kicks off on Monday with our annual hackathon, The Coder Games, followed by three days of technology-rich presentations discussing telecom, WebRTC, and IoT from developers around the world. To learn more, visit ClueCon.com or call 877-74-A-CLUE. And welcome to ClueCon Weekly. Today is the ninth day of, excuse me, the fifth day of September 2018. And this week, we're joined by Kim Schumacher, all the way from Europe. And he's going to be talking about uh, various things that he's done with FreeSwitch. Uh, for you guys that don't know Kim, he is the uh, developer and maintainer of the uh, FreeSwitch ESL library for the uh, for uh, one of the languages. And I forget which one it is off the top of my head. Dart, excuse me, for Dart. And he's also developed a call center application that uses uh, that's web based and uses free switch in the core. So uh, you guys hang out for that. It should be a real interesting conversation. Uh, first, let's welcome Miss Abby for the news. Miss Abby, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. Hi, everybody, and welcome to ClueCon Weekly. So if you have any questions during this call, please comment in the YouTube, HipChat, or IRC channels, and we will try to answer them live during this call. So a lot of exciting things have been happening in the free switch world. If you haven't heard already, the free switch 1.8 public release is out. We also have a lot of new content up on our YouTube channel, like our newest free switch with Fred video and our very own Kiki challenge. So check out our YouTube channel to see those videos. Also, make sure to check out our free switch website every Thursday for a free switch blog and other news updates that are going on with the free switch team. So next year, ClueCon is going to be from August 5th through 8th. This year it was a little early. It's all back to normal. ClueCon is August 5th through 8th. So make sure you mark your calendars for that. And if you can't wait that long to see us, Good news for you, Free Switch is going to AstroCon this year, and Anthony Minasali will be speaking there, so you can catch the team at AstroCon this October. As usual, please be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and sign up for our mailing list to get these and even more fantastic news and announcements from the Free Switch team. And if you are watching this video live right now, go ahead and give this video a share so other people can watch it too. All right, thank you guys for listening. Back to you, Ken. All right. Thank you very much, Abby. Uh, so now we're going to welcome uh, Mr. Mike Jarris for Community Corner. Uh, Mike is one of the core uh, free switch developers, and he's been around the project since the very beginning. Uh, hold on. That's not working out the right way. How about that? Let's try this one. <laughs> hey, Mike, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. So uh, this week, we got a, a question from the mailing list. Uh, Igor asked, uh, is there any way to detect, uh, to make silence detection on the start of a call? Um, like he wants to answer a call, play back a uh, ringing to the A leg, and, and meanwhile, listen to see that they're not sending any audio uh, as a way to fight uh, telemarketers and spam calling. Um, so this is kind of like, uh, our wait for silence function, except for wait for silence requires some audio to kind of seed it. And then it waits for silence. Um, so it doesn't quite fit the bill. There is, however, a completely undocumented function that someone added recently in the last six months or so called detect silence which works just like wait for silence, except um, it has one less argument. You don't have to have the number of pits uh, of sound beforehand. Um, and that is designed for exactly what you're trying to do. Um, so 
that that can be used uh, and, and you would just call the detect silent application and then after um, after that is uh, uh, I'm sorry uh, after that is run you check variables um, specifically there's a detect underscore silence underscore timeout variable um, set to true or false and that'll tell you whether um, it hit the timeout or not so I think that solves your problem a little bit tricky to do in dial plan um, maybe a little bit easier to do in something like a little script um, but definitely doable so basically if I get this right so we can use detect silence on an answered call and then we can look for media coming in from the caller so we can make sure that they're not just trying to start jamming us media like telemarketers just love to do yeah so it's uh uh detect silence args are the silence threshold number of silence hits in a timeout Pretty cool. Is that uh, documented on confluence or is that still undocumented it's out there? not documented i had to go look for this uh, when I was reading the question, um, it, it is identical to wait for silence except for the one last argument, um, and it doesn't wait for that initial sound before it starts detection. Right. So this might be a good excuse to say, hey guys, if you want to help document free switch, join the dots list, and you can help search through stuff like this with Mike, and Mike will tell you what uh, tell you some of the stuff, and you can go document it on Confluence for everybody else to see. <laughs> And uh, I'm sure that Mike and the team would love help with any kind of documentation like that. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Jarris. Let you give back to your day. And now we're going to be joined uh, by Kim. Kim, how are you doing, sir? Oh, I think you're muted, Kim. Let's get you unmuted. There you oh. go. I oh, you. thank you. <laughs> Thanks. How are you doing? I am doing very well still. Yeah. So uh, let's see here. If I remember correctly, you're in Denmark. Is that correct? That is correct. And uh, so I know uh, you, you've written a few things for free switch. So uh, one of the things is uh, the ESL library for Dart, for the Dart language. Uh, what can you yeah, tell us about that's... real quick? Um, about the, the Dart library? Yes. Yes. Um, it, uh, it came to be via a pretty odd and long way. It, uh, it started back when we, uh, when we started the, the, uh, what is now called the open reception project. Um, and, uh, really we started out using, uh, like any other sane person at that point in time would with, uh, asterisk, <laughs> we then got smarter. <laughs> later on, we got smarter. So, uh, we moved, but, um, and back at that time we used Ada, uh, as our main language. So what I did back in those days was that I, uh, I created um, a library written entirely in Ada um, for the, uh, for the uh, asterisk AMI. And um, I, and we also made a very prelim preliminary uh, AGI interface, uh, which I, I wasn't really that fond of, but um, I can get back to that. Um, but, but the, the AMI was uh, pretty much uh, a pain to handle because um, either you had to have a lot of logic into your library to be able to track the channels or you had to add that logic to your uh, application. So um, eventually we uh, ended up with uh, trying out FreeSwitch. And um, well, I, I can tell you again, this was a very nice experience. Uh, because everything was uh, so much uh, nicer and cleaner and uh, really well defined. Um, so, um, but but we were actually still using Ada for that one, and um, technically those libraries are still uh, available. I'm I'm not maintaining them, 
Um, but uh, later uh, in our development process, we um, we ended up ditching uh, Ada entirely, um, which also meant that that uh, one of our one of our uh, main developers left the team. So <laughs> it was a controversial decision, but that meant that uh, we had to. Um, well, basically, we wanted to have a, a clean stack um, because we already changed from JavaScript in our web client into using Dart. Um, so we wanted to have really just uh, one single language to um, to everything. Um, and it turned out that uh, Dart was a really good match for uh, FreeSwitch. Basically, uh, it is a uh, it's a I don't know if you know anything about it. No, no. What is Dart? Uh, I mean, I know a lot of different languages, but Dart was not one I had heard of before. <laughs> no. uh, <laughs> and before I look at your uh, library. Yeah, uh, but have you heard? You have heard of Ada? Yes. Yeah, and you know, obviously, we 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 chose this for our application because we thought if it's good enough for building uh, space shuttles and rockets and these cool things, then it's obviously the best choice for us for building a a phone application. Right. Well, <laughs> but what we uh, really liked uh, about that is that uh, Ada is extremely type safe and it warns you a lot about a lot of things at uh, compile time, so you can avoid a lot of runtime errors just by uh, um, having your compiler be more strict. But it's also very rigid to uh, to develop in. But um, Dart is a fairly recent language. It is uh, released by Google, and uh, it's um, it's it's been developed after a Go language um, in time, and its primary focus was to be a JavaScript killer. So it's it's built by the team that uh, also built the uh, V8 engine in Chrome, um, and they, they uh, at some point in time, they realized that the V8 engine had some shortcomings. It wasn't really fast enough, and they couldn't squeeze any more um, performance out of it. So what they wanted to do was to basically start over with a new VM, which ran an entirely different language that um, would then, um, as an intermediate step, compile to JavaScript. Um, for, and for the first few years, they were targeting browsers and uh, server side. So basically, you had a language that you could run both in your browser and on your server. And uh, for um, for the last few years, they have also targeted cell phones. So um, they have this framework called Flutter, which makes uh, cross um, cross platform applications which means that you basically have one language for your server application, your web application, and your mobile application. Obviously, you have a different view, but still, uh, there are some uh, differences. So, so um, it's kind of like Go, where, you, where Go is kind of compile and run pretty much anywhere. Dart is more targeted for like user interface and then the backend application to support the user interface. Yeah, exactly. But you have uh, pretty nice uh, backend support as well, cool. um, and uh, and the language itself is um, it's it's sort of a hybrid between uh, JavaScript and Java and C sharp. So it's it, it it, it look, yeah, it is, but it's it's not um, it's not prototype oriented like uh, JavaScript is. So it's actually it's it's easy. Uh, it's easier to learn than JavaScript because you don't need to know all of these weird quirks and how object uh, inheritance works in JavaScript and these things. Um, but it's pretty easy to uh, to start with, and um, it's uh, it's quite efficient when you get the hang of it. And you have uh, nice analysis, static analysis tools, and uh, type inference, and also type annotations. So it's uh, it's basically it's what they call an optionally typed language. So 
um, you can add all types and have a very, very strong static uh, analysis, or you can emit the types and leave the um, VM uh, to, uh, or leave the type inference to the VM or runtime. And, and so, uh, so one of the things that you mentioned there was that you built this DSL library and you started out in ADA and then you went to Dart and then, but you really built that for open, uh, open reception, right? Yeah, that's what, true. What's open reception? Well, again, that is, um, that is a project that we started it, uh, for, for quite some time back. Um, we had this, uh, again, now we're around, we're, um, circling around the languages, but we had this, um, ADA programmers, uh, user group where one of the members, uh, he had a reception hosting business. So it's, I think it makes more sense for, uh, for us in this domain, but it doesn't make sense for a lot of other people, but it's, uh, it's basically, um, a business that has a number of receptionists and then handles, uh, incoming calls for a number of businesses. So, uh, we, we had about, I think it was six or 700, uh, active companies that uh, this business handled phone calls for. So they took incoming calls and then either took messages or redirected the calls to, to employees of the business that they answered the phone for. And um, he, um, the, the owner of this had, um, had this existing system, which was, um, well, it was working. Let's say that. Let's start with that. Um, but it was um, quite old at that point. It was based on uh, on Windows XP, um, both on the server and the client, which was kind of odd. And um, and then it um, it used the T API, Tapa. Ta how do you pronounce that? You know it. Tappy, yes, Tappy, you know, the proprietary protocol um, for uh, f desk phones. Right. Um, yeah. And then it had uh, uh, this fat client next to it. So every receptionist had the desk with a computer and a phone next to them using this proprietary protocol. And then it was uh, hooked up to a uh, hardware PBX with a uh, ISDN lines. So, you know, I think it's, it's pretty standard setup. Um, but this was a pretty, uh, customized application and the storage was done in, uh, two kinds of databases where one being, uh, Firebase, which was okay, I guess. Um, the other being access, which was being, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it gets better. Um, the way that they uh, shared this, you know, because we need, obviously when you have multiple uh, agents, you need to share this database. So uh, the, the way you do it is obviously by creating a Samba share and then letting uh, your agents connect to that. And that gives, uh, you know, <laughs> all sorts of interesting locking problems, but yeah, anyway. And then also here, we also get to one of the shortcomings of Windows XP because Actually, uh, the when you use this is a a, a desktop um, operating system, so it only allows five simultaneous clients to be connected via Samba Share. Right. So they so were quite sort of, the number of agents that they could even have. On the, <laughs> the number. Of yeah. It, have yeah talk about a glass ceiling. Yeah. Wow. Growth limiter yeah. there. Yeah, but then then he learned about um, he learned about uh, you know uh, open source Samba and uh, you know we, you you learn to cope and work around these things. But uh, the thing was that this application wasn't really geared towards ho handling these. I think it was around uh, 50,000 calls um, a month. So um, 
it it really suffered uh, because they I guess they had some dangling transactions and things like that. So sometimes it just crashed and and gave some ghost calls uh, and um, it also needed some database scrubs where you basically have to export your entire database and import it again. And then it just, you know, um, generally needed restarting every day. So what he was, what we were doing in the end was putting this because um, while we were doing this project, uh, Windows XP went uh, end of life. So we actually went in as, as a temporary solution put these Windows XP machines into an immutable virtual box image. So at least if they were infected with something, we could just turn them off and start them up again. And then hopefully they hadn't affected anything else. Um, so at one of these um, ADA programmers uh, user group meetings, we talked about this and, you know, we talked about all the shortcomings of this system and obviously like, you know, how developers are, you say, yeah, we can definitely do this better. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah. <I> <laughs> that, yeah. That was, so, that was, so, that was basically. So, so let me guess. So you guys are sitting around the, the ADA developers meeting. And talking about all that, and, and somebody goes, "Oh, well, you know, there's this open source VoIP stuff sitting over here, and then we can write yes. our own controls and web UIs and everything." And then so you start with Ada and Asterisk, and then you end up on, you know, some time later on FreeSwitch using Dart as the interface. And yeah. uh, do you do you still develop and uh, support that today, or uh, have you just uh, is it uh, something that you just set out there and people find it and use it on occasion. Um, I'm not, I think, I think it's only being used by this one company um, because the, because after, after we, we, we set out um, to do this, it took, I don't know, maybe four years to, to, to get it um, working and uh, actually working in a condition that we could actually deploy it because we also wanted to do um, a hot deployment uh, of the application. Um, so when we started out, we wanted to to do uh, a startup where we like I, I guess sort of like um, the the free switch model uh, wanted to provide this as uh, a free product and just uh, selling a support uh, service and um, module development. But um, as time passed, uh, people started uh, abandoning the project and, um, you know, um, I, I wanted to see it through and um, eventually I, I, I got it uh, deployed at the, the business and we got the old system replaced and it's, it's, it's working to this day. Uh, and it's it's extremely stable. I am not getting any support calls, which is, I guess, bad because that means I don't make any money. Out of it. That means you programmed it too good. Yeah, I know. There's no money in making good programs. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, that, that's actually uh, pretty cool. So when you were uh, when you were developing this platform. Um, I know you, you kind of hinted at some of the difficulties that you were having with AMI and some of the reasons that you went to free switch. Uh, but once you got onto free switch, what were some of the uh, problems that you had to, uh, you know, that you had to tackle, uh, you know, between Dart and free switch to get you where you really needed to go? Yeah, well, as I said, um, Dart and free switch was actually a, a pretty good match um, because when I was doing the the library in ada i was um, constrained to having uh, multiple threads you know because i had to have uh, reader or writer loops and these and uh, these primitive things and in general i don't know if it's, it's this is a personal opinion but i'm not really that fond of having uh threads in uh, libraries 
Um, so so um, turning to Dart, which uses an, an internal, uh, I think it's called event loop, um, where it simply uh, pulls the operating system and checks if data is available via a socket and, and emits it into a stream, meaning means that it 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 supported the asynchronous model of uh, of free switch very well. And it also had built in JSON decoding. So I soon found out that I could just start up the ESL uh, socket um, connection and then just set it to JSON mode. And then I had, I was just given the deserialization of objects. So the, the, I guess the, the core of the ESL library can be written in maybe, I don't know, 50 or 100 lines of code it's it really is that good of a match um so so the 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 problems there wasn't really um that big the problems was more because we uh, in in our project we needed um to to capture what was the internal state of free switch um by uh, the events by the event socket and uh, event sourcing i guess and um, then map this into our own representation of like, for instance, a call and what is it doing right now? Uh, is it available for pickup? And, um, you know, these challenges. And um, one, one big uh, challenge that we had uh, was the, actually the, the bridging model. So um, we have these, we, we eventually ended up having uh, table phones, we, we went through uh, quite a lot of uh, discussions on what we should do if we should do soft phones or hard phones, but we ended up with uh, hard phones, uh, SNOM phones, uh, great phones, uh, they have been so reliable. Um, but um, we, we wanted to have a model where we didn't trust the phone being available. So technically you could uh, pull the plug on a phone and you could divert a call to this phone and it would time out or things like that. And that would give uh, a bad uh, caller experience. So we went with a model where the, the call controller uh, dials the, um, the phone, the agent's phone, the receptionist phone first and parks it, parks the channel and then after we have a confirmed channel, then we uh, make the bridge with the uh, with the the, yeah, the target channel, the incoming call. And that gave us some challenges because uh, there are some things with codec negotiation that doesn't really fit this model. And as I've understood later on, this is not really a standard way of doing things, um, but it. It has worked pretty well for us until up until now. Yeah, there, there's a uh, in free switch. Anthony spent many years developing the bridge code, and so there's a lot of edge cases there that I would imagine you probably had to deal with in your code. Uh, by by yeah, and and yeah. and we honestly we see that a lot, and there's reasons uh, like what you said. You know, make sure that you've got a good agent. Uh, before you bridge a call to them. So there's a lot of good, you know, business reasons for doing things the way that you're doing them. But there's also a lot of technical reasons where that may be the more difficult way to do it. So, but uh, I can see in your use case where that's probably, you know, a valid use case for bypassing some of the bridge code and manually, yeah. uh, manually doing that. Um, and, and it can be difficult. Uh, like you said, codec negotiation is always a fun one. Uh, yeah. Begin, especially, yes, especially if you end up with 729 on one side and say PCMA on the other side. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hopefully you have 729 licenses on there, or <laughs> you know. Yeah, I, I think I think I think we're actually uh, <laughs> negotiating to PCMA all the time. But yeah. you know, so so this is definitely one of the things that I would change if I were to go back. But you know, it, hey, it works. <laughs> Hey, no, no, it it, it, it yeah. does. Uh, so on on the on the deployment that that uh, you helped do there, how many 
Um, I think you said there was like 700 or so businesses at, 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 one, at, uh, at you know, when you guys were deploying that. How many agents do, were, you, were they uh, required to support um, all those calls coming in? Um, I, I honestly don't remember. I think it was 10 plus or something. Um, it wasn't really, it wasn't that many because, um, well, they're just answering the, the phone call volume. Handed them Sorry? They're just really, cause all they're really doing is like a receptionist. They're answering the phone, taking a message or transferring the call to somebody that's actually going to deal with the, the incoming call. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and uh, the the target was to to keep the call very short. Um, so I think uh, I I don't know if I, if the the limit was thirty seconds or one minute. Um, and that also um, that also um, gave us uh, the the design constraint that we needed to make the user interface. Uh, have a lot of information because they needed this information off the top uh, um, like immediately and um, they also needed to uh, be able to uh, access all of the commands via the keyboard so basically a mouse is a cache miss wow cool so once they get it they can they don't even have to go to the mouse they can just hit uh, you know control t or whatever to transfer yeah, something it yeah right to and that was also a quite big challenge because uh, the 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 brow uh, overriding basically any or basically every um, shortcut in a browser is uh, not a trivial task. Yeah, <laughs> they, they they like to make it difficult. <laughs> they like to make it difficult. Yeah. Yeah, um, but uh, no, that's uh, that that's pretty cool. So if uh, so. Uh, where can uh if i wanted to go find the code for either the library or uh open reception where can i find that at um you can find it on github but uh i have to say that um i let this um go around two years ago uh and i think it has it has been uh, maintained uh, internally because uh, one of the, the the core developers is uh, the the business owner, so he is actually um, able to fix a lot of the things themselves, which also uh, not speaks in my favor because that's no support for me. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. And um, but but the code is available on GitHub, and uh, if anyone wants to try it out, I will be. Uh, happy to help with setting it up because uh, I think even though I have created uh, some documentation uh, on how to set it up, uh, you're going to need a little bit of help because uh, recently Google decided to bump the Dart version to version 2.0 and uh, remove the old links to the old um, sub 2.0. And there are some breaking changes because you know it's it's a major language change. So thank you, Google. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it happens. It's sometimes. Yeah, you know, uh, I, yeah, I I can understand the the you have to move forward thinking, but it it's just annoying for the rest of us that has to keep up. Yeah. Um, no, it, it, it's but very but funny. it's. Uh, but, it's, but it is a nice application, and uh, you should definitely uh, uh, check it out. And um, it's uh, if you are able to do a little bit of development, I would guess that you could make uh, of some profit out of this because it's uh, it's a quite stable application. You know, it has been running for I think two and a half year uh, without any issues, um, and it's uh, it's uh, targeted towards um, yeah, reception hosting businesses, but uh, technically it can be used in uh, all, all reception contexts. So just for single businesses that need phone reception and needs some sort of user interface that can provide you with uh, a lot of information. Definitely, definitely a cool project. And uh, I mean, I've been around FreeSwitch for, well, pretty much since before FreeSwitch 1.0. Uh, yeah, and 
I had never heard of your project until recently. <laughs> and, uh, we, you know, uh, people are always looking for, uh, you know, a reception console or something like this. So maybe this is, uh, we'll post, uh, I'll post links to this on the YouTube video, uh, plus any yeah. other links that Kim wants to share. Um, we'll post those down in the comments on uh, YouTube so you guys can see those. Uh, you know, we'll do that in post uh, so you can find those easily. Uh, but uh, yeah, this uh, this look this looks pretty cool. This might be an excuse to look at Dart and uh, kind of see what that's like because uh, I've I've got my own projects that are written in uh, we won't say what languages uh, that it's it's get they're getting a bit long in the tooth and it's time to uh, you know upgrade them also. So we're we're, yeah, you know. we're debating. Uh, I want to actually. I want to ask this. So one of the things that we're looking at, we have some code uh, at my day job that's uh, written in a scripting language. I won't say which one, um, uh, but it might be PHP. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and it it, it works, um, and it's just doing a lot of text processing. So I mean, it, it works for doing that. Um, but uh, we're you know it, it's reaching. It, it's showing its age. Uh, it's all PHP 5 code. PHP 7 is all the rage now. And so it's it's time to look at either upgrading that code or uh, going to a different language. So, uh, as you mentioned, Dart came after Go. Um, and is there a reason that you guys ended up using Dart and not using Go on some of this? Uh, how did you, you know, choose between where you went from Ada? Well, it 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 started with because it started with the user interface because uh, we 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 also we started out having this user inter our user interface mainly as a proof of concept written in JavaScript, and um, everyone hated JavaScript. Um, and I, I think uh, we're not the only ones that hates JavaScript. But you know, it, it was basically the the evil that you have to deal had to deal deal with. Sorry. Um, when doing user interfaces in uh, in HTML, because we really wanted to do a web-based client for this one. Um, so uh, then I think it was uh, it was pre 1.0 uh, Dart came along, and we wanted to try this out. And I think around the 1.0 release, we rewrote our user interface into using Dart. So it was it was sort of a, a rolling process. So we we started out with the um, oh my screen got blank. Um, we started out with um, replacing the user interface, and then we had uh, the entire server core was written in Ada. We started removing the um, the all of the the primitive data processing, you know, just REST interfaces that just took some data from a database and then put it um, by a REST interface. And this could might as well be done in Dart because it supported uh, Postgres uh, as we um, like we used. Uh, so um, then then we figured out okay, so this is actually quite easy to do, and development time was uh, uh, going down because everything was um, being redeployed rapidly. We didn't have to do recompilation. This is an uh, interpreted language, so we just edited a file and then uh, accessed the server again. Um, and so, as I said, eventually we we I rewrote the 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 call switching or the call call flow control core of our application into Dart as well, um, and and it has I we really haven't looked back since. Um, we also have we have uh, an extensive set of uh, unit testing. Um, well, it's not really unit testing; it's basically very high level end to end testing, uh, also written in Dart. Where we uh, spawn zip agents and uh, actually dial into our application, uh, testing entire uh, call flows. Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, and it was no, no, extremely I mean, cool. Is the is the uh, is the zip UA actually written in Dart, or is Dart no. controlling external? Is so it's controlling something like ZipSack or something like that to do the call flows? Yeah, it's. Um, I have uh, I, it, it's based on the PJ SIP library. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're using the PJ SUA, uh, which we also we started out using. Uh, actually, we also tried using an, an, an Ada wrapper for that one, but but that was just totally unfeasible. So we 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 used uh, Python. It has a Python wrapper, 
and um, uh, but and then we wrap that around a twisted framework to provide a REST interface because then we could also use it as a soft phone for application. Um, but the Python uh, or the yeah the Python PA, PJSUA um, was turned out to be pretty unstable and uh, did a lot of weird logins and it also uh, sec faulted at times because apparently it didn't really handle uh, events that well. So I looked into it and it seems like there was this uh, huge lock in the middle that when it failed to get that, it couldn't really synchronize and it couldn't allocate the events. So uh, I thought, well, but this is really the thing that, you know, uh, a higher level language as Python should guard you against. So just fix it for me or get out of the way. So um, I took the raw C code and then I built my own uh, user agent from the PJS UA and then just provided some um, REST-ish uh, standard in standard art pipe uh, and then wrapped that into a Dart process wrapper. So I could control it programmatically uh, via Dart, but it was uh, just you know, spawning a process um, and then controlling that, remote controlling that. So uh, is, is that code available? Uh, am I looking in the right spot here? So I'm looking at the open reception uh, repo. Yeah, one. I think, oh, um, is, that, is that the code that's in the integration test folder? Yeah, I think there is. And there is a, a make file there, um, which builds, it's called it's called basic agent. Um, it, it's really not feature complete. It's feature complete enough for us uh, to do uh, uh, high level integration testing and do some basic account registration and things like that. But it, it, it's pretty easy to expand upon. Um, I just uh, wrap, uh, or I just wrap around the, um, the PJ SUA uh, calls. And then yeah, for that, that to be cool for people still though, that they could, it, it, there's the potential I see here is for, uh, you know, someone like me or someone that may not want to build the entire test suite. You've already got a test suite started here so they can do the high level testing. Um, yeah. You know, just simple things like put in a call flow, make sure I get a call answer, you know, play a sound file. Uh, yeah, you know, exactly. That kind of stuff. Make sure I can register to this, you know, to the process. Just some, some high level testing like that goes a long way, even if you're not, uh, even if you don't have the time or necessarily to do unit level testing, it's, it's, uh, in some ways, you it's in some ways it's not as thorough as unit level testing, but in other ways it still lets you know if something is horribly broken before you take it to the yeah product. exactly yeah exactly and and that was kind of my my take on it because we we had unit tests but they were just infeasible because our code changed so much all the time uh, it was like uh, four years of continuously refactoring everything. So you can imagine unit tests are, you know, it's just another thing that will break during your refactor. So I thought, well, why not just tell the system how I want it to behave from a high level? And then I don't really care how it's implemented. If it is, if it's able to handle this call flow and provide this data at this point in time, then I do not care how it is implemented or if it leaks memory or, you know, I, I, I can I can live with that, but I just need it to be feature complete right now. Right. And then you can come back and you can use some of the other tools for looking for memory leaks. and, and Yeah, exactly. Uh, like uh, the right tool for the job. Right. Yeah, you're, you're not going to look for memory leaks with uh, a UA. Uh, you know, I mean, let's face it, oh. you're going to be <laughs> exactly. or, or something like that. You're going to use some of the other, you know, appropriate tools that are available for that. But just being able to see that your yeah. call flows are, are actually working right, that's a, that's a huge thing, especially for people that are doing things, whether, you know, they're scripting free switch call flows with Lua or in the dial plan, or maybe maybe they're uh, using mod v8 so that, and they're scripting that in javascript i mean there's dozens of different ways to you know deal with yeah, you know, yeah exactly. so but that gives them a way to do that so uh, uh, i just i just all that and i thought that's that's kind of cool <laughs> and so uh look for the link <laughs> to that guys uh, go check it out on github and give kim feedback on that um 
because that, that that's cool stuff. Uh, uh, I'm sure you can find we can you know everybody can find different ways to expand on that, and uh, that's what we do with open source. So we uh, take something that Kim did, add it to something that Tony did, and we come up with something completely different. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I would, I would really love to have feedback uh, on it. Um, right now, um, I also think that the the reason that uh, you don't know anything about it, Ken, is that we we uh, are not salesmen and we don't do marketing. We 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 cannot, for the life of us, do it. So um, yeah. we're we're humble people, you know. So okay, we we may, maybe it's not you know the best thing that we have and. You know. But I think no. that's that's maybe a general uh, developer mentality. You know, you, you just, you know, I, I just did it. You know. Well, I well, I mean, you, you find that so often with open source. Uh, you know, you yeah. have developers like yourself. You have a problem that you want to address, and you come up with a solution for it. Maybe it's not the best solution. Maybe it's a super cool solution. Maybe it's just a mediocre solution. It doesn't matter. It's somewhere between it works and it's super cool. And then you know, open source developer turns around and they put it out on GitHub or they post it to their own website or whatever. And then, you know, a couple of years down the road, maybe somebody notices, notices it. Or even with FreeSwitch, Tony, does, Anthony Minasali does this to me all the time in FreeSwitch. Hey, Tony, uh, what about this new feature? And he's like, oh, dude, I did that like three years ago. Go look over here in this <laughs> section of code. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, come on, man. This is... <laughs> You know, we could talk about this because it's a really cool feature. And yeah. uh, so, I mean, I'm not a sales guy. I just like talking to people. Uh, and same thing with Mike Malbrutus, who's usually here uh, in my place right now. Uh, you know, we like we we like to see this kind of thing. And we like to see, you know, what you guys, the developers, are working on. And uh, so yeah. uh, I'm going to try to uh, shift gears a little, a little bit. You know, um, you know, so a lot of this work you've done is, uh, you know, previous stuff. And I know you've moved, uh, you're working on stuff other than uh, telephony some these days. Uh, but is there, uh, is there some, any cool stuff that you wanted to show us that uh, maybe that I'm totally missing here? Um, um, that, uh, I can, I can give you a, a brief view of the uh, application. Oh, that'd be cool. You can demo it for us. Yeah, you know, it's a rough demo, you know. It's it's been uh, it's been 2 years since I I um last uh, set up a, a stack of this. So uh, I think a lot of things aren't working as they and as they are intended, but um, no, no. Well, let's uh we'll, we'll still James yeah. Bodie's idea and let's just call this a dangerous demo. Yeah, it's it's like every time you have to do demos. I think it's like that, so. <laughs> it's the the curse of doing uh, live demos. Yes. But, uh, so are you ready? Oh. Yeah. Right, so let's get your screen up here. Oh, there we go. Oh, that's actually kind of cool. Yeah. And uh, I can't understand very many words on here because I'm guessing that's uh, Dutch. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. It's Danish. Some oh, of it is Danish anyway. Um, but, yeah, um, the reason why some of it is in Danish because uh, as part of our integration uh, testing, which I did, I did a, a sort of ran randomizing data populator. So I'm populating a new database on every test. Um, yeah, and uh, I have then hacked that feature into just creating a new data store for me uh, with uh, a lot of uh, auto-generated uh, test data. So uh, these are not really <laughs> live data and I don't have access to the live test and so um, But um, we have, uh, as you can see, if I can uh, toggle the, um, the uh, what's it called? Help? Legend? Uh -huh. uh, legend? Yes. Um, so, so this uh, gives us um, uh, um, a brief explanation on what the uh, shortcuts is. I can go to uh, Alt S to search for a given uh, contact within this reception. I can go to the Alt V to um, 
focus the reception window so I can go and then uh, do a live search on maybe this one or this one. Go to jump to this uh, filter here. Um, there's supposed to be a calendar. Apparently, this one doesn't work on my development branch. Um, <laughs> and then there's uh, here in the uh, contact data, you have uh, like basic information about this uh, person. Um, well, what do you want to do when a, a call comes in? You just want to put them through, or do you want to always uh, take a message? And we have phone numbers, and um, you can um, tag those. The red ones are uh, private uh, phone numbers. So, you know, it, it's only for when family members call in and say, oh, but you're sick and needs to uh, be picked up in daycare or something like that. So, so it's not for business use. Um, and then we have uh, here the uh, uh, sent message. Um, so whenever you have a contact, it will send the, the message to whatever email address uh, is associated to this uh, contact. And um, on the, the other shortcuts, we also have uh, the mes a message archive. I just uh, changed the view. Um, so for this given person, you can see what has previously been sent by uh, all agents. So sometimes um, people dial in and say, what are my messages? Because they don't want to get them on email or, you know. Right. And then there is uh, some extra data. Uh, so uh, as I said, we, we need to have a lot of information in this user interface. So this is the, uh, the extra data. Um, and email addresses, alternate names for the company, and whether the banking information, official telephone numbers, uh, headquarter numbers. And then we have this uh, mini wiki, which is, uh, we found a, uh, uh, I think it's markdown parser um, that, uh, so, so that we put to use in this uh, me. So, um, the back office people can actually write custom commands into this uh, just in a markdown language. But all and these, boxes, it, it, so all these boxes here where, where I'm seeing like Alt F, Alt C, Alt X, that's all your hotkeys for jumping around that you had to implement to override the browser? Yeah. And um, so for here, uh, this section here, the, the bottom right corner, you have uh, the queue, that is your local queue, the, the calls that you have parked right now. And then you have, uh, no, sorry, the queue is the, the global queue um, of available calls that is going in to the system or that is currently in the PBX. And then the my calls is the calls that you have parked. So you can see and pretty much in this but yeah and then I, I think we've implemented the my calls as sort of a, a stack so you always uh, take from the top call um, so based on action so if you do a transfer uh, from an active call you always take, take the, the two top calls and transfer those so if you if you try to transfer calls from a different context I think it won't let you because you know you don't need uh, a person from uh, a dry cleaning service to be bridged with a customer from uh, that wants to talk to a lawyer, for instance. So th there are some safeguards here. Um, I have um, here, I have started the, uh, let's see if I can do, um, I've started the, uh, the basic agent for me, um, where you can see, I don't know if it's clear. Yeah, oh, yeah maybe it's clear. Um, so I've just, uh, run this, um, command. So I just state that I want to have, uh, this is my username. This is my, uh, password. This is the host I want to connect. And this is my client port. So this is, uh, how I am being connected to, and it starts listening on, yeah, UDP transport 5060. Um, then it, uh, I have, I had to create uh, an input file, um, because, um, Otherwise, when I do in testing, it will uh, they the free switch will drop the calls due to uh, inactivity, so it doesn't detect any uh, sound input. So I'm just 
playing back a tone. And this also gives me the um, the benefit of uh, being able to better t load test my application because I ac I'm actually transferring media. And um, so this is just uh, a basic, uh, mm, I do think something like this. Uh, I remember correctly. Oh, this one just dials and outputs um, a lot of uh, events. What happened to this call? I can see it stopped in state six, which means it was hanged up because it received a 403. So this wasn't a valid um, extension in uh, free switch. So it's not really configured. Um, I can show you maybe a bit of the um, backend application as well. Um, this is basically uh, just data management. Uh, I'm sorry, translating it. Um, but uh, hey, it's open source, so <laughs> I can give you the, the, the labels. Um, we have a top level data model where uh, an organization is like uh, the billing organization of a um, of a, a, a collection of incoming receptions. And then uh, we have the receptions here where uh, they have, for instance, a dial plan. And when we do, um, I have this, um, but. Oh, that one actually worked. Nice. So um, I don't know if you can see this, but in when we do a dial plan, we actually uh, create the, we compile the dial plan from a model into an XML file and then reloads the configuration via reload XML in uh, FreeSwitch. Um, so, and that so was because which then it's not actually having to ask the back end constantly what to do with the call when a new no. call comes. It's already, you've already got the XML preloaded so that FreeSwitch can deal with that, with what it's already got loaded in the memory. And then yeah, exactly. when we really need to do something about it, um, that gives you some, a little bit better scalability than yeah. trying to make a decision. That's actually and, kind of cool. uh, yeah, and uh, that's why you know I mentioned that I wasn't really fond of the AGI Asterisk Gateway interface, and uh, it was because this is that basically gives you a, a two-way dependency from your application to your PBX, and this way I only have one way. I'm I'm just letting the PBX do whatever it does best, handling calls, and then I try to keep up by uh, the event socket. And then sending commands in, just please send me send this call to this person or bridge this leg. Um, and all of the the data that I have, um, or all the the, the dial plan information that I have, is um, is known beforehand. So why not uh, why not uh, uh, ex exploit that? I don't know, missed that word. One last thing, I guess. Um, I've done this. Um, it's a it's the the dial plan language. It's a half JSON based, half uh, DSL based. So you can do like this. So I have Monday to Wednesday from four to twelve. And when you you do a change, um, it automatically re-renders. So I can move this up, and this gives you. Um, a color-coded calendar view on how this dial plan will look um, yeah, in a schedule. Um, so we have different uh, actions to take depending on which time slot you're in. And this is uh, coded here, uh, color-coded here. Well, maybe I can also show. I, I did. Uh, this was one of the last features I got to do. This is uh, um, uh, this. This is supposed to provide an overview of all your agents and what they're doing right now. So this is uh, the agent here. Um, so now I have sloppy focus, and um, I have my uh, um, receptionist client in focus now, and I have had it for 19 seconds. When I remove focus, then it will go to non not 
focused um, when we'll count the time. This will enable you to see if your uh, your agents are doing anything else than looking into uh, the, um, the user interface. It will also see uh, which uh, widget you have currently selected. It sends out this. So there are the features. There is also uh, a complete uh, CDR um, overview, building type, all these things. I have uh, made some Gantt diagram thing um, on how all your agents did over time and how many breaks they took and things like that. Um, yeah, but I guess um, yeah, no, that, yeah, that, that, I guess that's, that's it. That's pretty cool. So um, now I see what looks like a Euro identify uh, icon in there. Is that is that does this have some billing built in for uh, a person that wanted to do like that a receptionist type service or? Um, yeah, exactly. Like yeah. So so we have uh, which reception here. So um, you can fetch out uh, billing information. I don't know which. I'm guessing it will be uh, some uh, CSV format or something like that. And uh, we we decided on um, implementing it by uh, just dumping everything uh, to the via the the CDR JSON. Uh, plugin and then uploading it to Google. What's it called? Google Cloud Storage. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, so this this has the ability to actually parse your JSON files. So we can we can um, then pull them back in a parsed manner, and then uh, do so, do the actual data uh, extraction from uh, another tool that we have. So so our mantra was that we just wanted to have as much data as possible. That's, that's pretty cool. You have to have a lot of data to do this stuff. Uh, you know, to do any kind of UI like this, it, it requires a lot of data, keeping up with a lot of data. So it's yeah. actually really cool. So, uh, but uh, yeah, so I mean, we're reaching about that time of uh, the day here, uh, Kim. So, uh, I mean, and, and I know it's getting late in the day there for you. Uh, it's probably about yeah. AP, is there? Uh, so yeah, I'm going to exactly. go ahead and Let's wrap this up for today. Is there anything else you want to say to our viewers uh, before we let you uh, head off into the evening to be with your family? Um, yeah, um, if you if you find this interesting, uh, you can uh, contact me. Um, you have my email address there, or uh, I'm also on LinkedIn. I'm pretty sure I'm the only one with uh, my name, so just look for that and. Um, yeah, I'm. I'll be. I'll be happy to help both uh, paid and unpaid. Preferably the first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So open source <laughs> devs, they have tools too. Uh, so if you can find one that can help you out, uh, you know, uh, contact the free switch guys. They'll help you with your free switch project. Uh, if you find uh, open reception useful, contact him. He can help you uh, get your get it implemented. And, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing is what keeps open source going and what keeps free code flowing is the people that actually help support those projects. So um, you do that. Uh, you, you find those guys and you help support them in one way or another. So, uh, Kim, thank you very much for joining us today. It's uh, definitely an interesting conversation. There's definitely some really cool stuff that you've worked on there. Um, and I know you'll keep working on cool stuff in the future. So uh, the next time you have something cool you want to show us, drop us an email. Let us know. We'll get you back in. Uh, we'll get you back in here uh, next week. Uh, next week for uh, everybody that's still watching. Uh, we're, I believe we've got Mr. Chad Phillips is going to be joining us. Uh, Chad's been around uh, the free switch community for a long time also. And he's he's worked on some very interesting projects. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what he's going to be showing us next week. We'll be back here at uh, noon U.S. Central Time on Wednesday. We'll see you then. Again, thanks, Kim, and we'll see you next week. Uh, if I can find the right name. You've been watching Tucon Weekly. Tune in every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Central. Keep up with the latest happenings by subscribing to our YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or visit us at freeswitch.com.